Back in 1917, the A.M. Smyre Manufacturing Company built a two-story brick textile mill on some land between Ranlow and Lowell here in Gaston County. To house its workforce nearby, the company followed the practice of the day for mills. It built its own village, a, a company town, partly with construction materials that had once provided housing for a military camp in Charlotte. While the Smyre family, for the most part, have long been out of the business, the community it founded remains, called Smyre. It was annexed into the city of Gastonia back in 1996. To be honest, it's not really the wealthy side of town. The evidence of mill houses remains quite prominent. But perhaps it is reminiscent of the part of town where Christians, who tended to be on the lower economic scale, lived during the first century AD in the mighty Asia Minor city of Smyrna, in modern day Turkey. Smyrna was an ancient city near the coast of the Aegean Sea with an excellent harbor, earning its wealth from trade. But after an invasion in the seventh century BC, the city was destroyed and unoccupied until rebuilt in the third century BC. The resurrected, if we could use that word, city of Smyrna became one of the most well-planned and beautiful cities of the day, referred to as the crown of Asia. The people of Smyrna took great pride in their city and expected their fellow residents to love it with fervor and to do whatever was necessary to maintain its status in the Roman Empire, including the worship of Caesar as a god. While many of the city's Jewish population apparently made peace with that requirement, the Christians could not and would not. That led to trouble and persecution. Christ, knowing their woes, had John of Patmos write a letter assuring the church in Smyrna that in the end, they would receive the victor's crown. Last Sunday, we introduced you to a sermon series titled, Seven Letters. Today and for the next three Sundays, we will be examining the letters from Christ to seven churches in Asia Minor that make up chapters two and three of the apocalyptic New Testament book of Revelation. While each letter addressed topics specific to the individual churches, each is also universal in its message perhaps the reason why they were all included in Revelation rather than individually delivered letters. Today, we will consider the first two letters to the churches in Ephesus and Smyrna, each with its own issues and own promises from Christ. By the way, despite the closeness in spelling there's no reason to believe the ancient Smyrna and the community named Smyre here in Gastonia have any connection. Following a great upheaval in the wake of World War I, Smyrna was largely burned and rebuilt as the Turkish city of Izmir, now the country's third largest city. A few churches remain in Smyrna, despite the overwhelmingly Muslim population. As far as I can tell, the Christians there now do not face the kind of persecutions endured 
by their ancient brothers and sisters. But the words written to them and the church in Ephesus still have meaning today around the world, including at Smyre in Gaston County. So we invite you to join us as we open the envelopes on the first two of seven letters. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Hello and welcome to the online worship service of Robbins Memorial Presbyterian Church in Gastonia, North Carolina for Sunday, July 14th, 2024. We are happy to report that donations are already coming in for our school tools drive for Robinson Elementary students. This is the fifth year that we are competing with sister churches to help out our nearby elementary schools with needed supplies. Of course, there are the usual items we are collecting, pencils, markers, crayons, composition notebooks, eraser caps, and so on. But we are also emphasizing items that might not immediately come to mind when thinking about school supplies. We encourage the donations of boxes of facial tissues, bandages, and sealable plastic storage bags as those are items in high demand with little funding available. You can bring your donations on Sundays inside our Narthex or any time of the day, any day of the week, by using the bigger blue box located on the south side of the church where the parking lot meets the ramp to the upstairs office wing. Our drive runs through August 11th, just a few days before the start of the new school year. Also, remember that work has already begun on our 18th car show here at Robinson Memorial. Scheduled for September 21st, it will be here before you know it. You can find information and sponsorship forms on our website. Right now, it's time to begin the service with our responsive call to worship. The earth is the Lord's and all that is in it, the world and those who live in it. Who shall ascend the hill of the Lord, and who shall stand in God's holy place? Those who have clean hands and pure hearts, who do not lift up their souls to what is false. Such is the company of those who seek the Lord, who seek the face of the God of Jacob. Let us worship God. Today's opening hymn of praise is, O oh, Worship the King. Please sing along as Ashley provides the music.
Hear these words from the prophet Isaiah. But now, thus says the Lord who created you, do not fear, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. When you pass through the water, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overwhelm you. When you walk through fire, you shall not be burned. And the flames shall not consume you. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. With this in mind, let us confess our sins before God. God of redeeming grace, have mercy upon us as we confess our sin. Charged to travel light, we overburden ourselves. Commissioned to preach repentance, we ourselves do not change. Cautioned to avoid violence, we are quick to confront others. Called to be reconcilers, we create divisions. As Christ sends us forth and equips us to serve him, cleanse us of abusing his trust and his name. And all God's people said, Amen. Remember that we have redemption through Christ's sacrifice on our behalf. We have forgiveness of sins according to the riches of God's grace. For God has made known to us in all wisdom and insight the mystery of God's will to unite all things in Him things in heaven, and things on earth. Friends, believe the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Our first New Testament reading comes to us from Revelation, chapter 2, verses 1 through 7. Listen to the word of our Lord. To the angel of the church in Ephesus write, These are the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand and walks among the seven golden lampstands. I know your deeds your hard work, and your perseverance. I know that you cannot tolerate wicked people, that you have tested those who claim to be apostles but are not, and have found them false. You have persevered and have endured hardships for my name and have not grown weary. Yet I hold this against you, you have forsaken the love you had at first. Consider how far you have fallen. Repent and do the things you did at first. If you do not repent, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place. But you have this in your favor. You hate the practices of the Nicolaitans which I also hate. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches, to the one who is victorious. I will give the right to eat from the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. 
Come, ye sinners, poor and needy, is our hymn of preparation. You'll find the lyrics at the bottom of your screen. Our second reading comes to us from Revelation, chapter 2, verses 8 through 11. To the angel of the church in Smyrna write, These are the words of him who is the first and the last, who died and came to life again. I know your afflictions and your poverty, yet you are rich. I know about the slander of those who say they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. Do not be afraid of what you are about to suffer. I tell you, the devil will put some of you in prison to test you, and you will suffer persecution for ten days. Be faithful, even to the point of death and I will give you life as your victor's crown. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. The one who is victorious will not be hurt at all by the second death. This is the word of our Lord. Thanks be to God. To the angel of the church in each of the seven letters to the seven churches in Revelation begins with these words, to the angel of the church. It's an interesting way to begin a letter. 
but its meaning may be opaque. Is the angel a person, a, a saint or leader of the church? Most all congregations have saints in their midst, many times not in leadership roles, though, and they're usually not representative of the whole. Is it what we call a guardian angel? A specific angel watching out for that specific church just as each person has his or her own guardian angel? That's possible, but many of these letters are full of admonishments. Are angels personally held accountable for the bad things their churches do? The truth is, we have no good explanation for why these letters are addressed to the angels of each church, those seven stars held in Jesus' right hand. What we do know is the lessons contained in the letters are for those believers who make up the individual congregations, yet these lessons can still be applied to the church of today, regardless of location. Most of Revelation is the product of John of Patmos recording what he saw, heard, and experienced in his vision from God. However, the observations, praises, and warnings given in the letters come directly from the risen Christ, dictated to John. You know, in Bibles that use red letter to indicate the direct quotes of Jesus, well, these letters are often printed in red. These are the words of Christ for the people of the seven churches and for us. See, the, the number seven is symbolic here, indicating wholeness or completeness. These seven churches are representative of the entire church, not just those individual congregations. The seven stars Jesus holds in his hand are us, just as much as are the seven lampstands among which John found Christ in his vision. But our message today begins in Ephesus. The Apostle Paul is credited with bringing Christianity to the important Asia Minor city of Ephesus, one of the Roman Empire's largest and wealthiest metropolitan areas, not far from the Aegean Sea. Due to its location, it was known as the Gateway to Asia, and its population was truly a melting pot of people from throughout the empire. It was the location of the Temple of Artemis, considered one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. It was also home to a large number of silversmiths who made their livelihood crafting idols for people to worship. When demand for their idols dropped, Paul got the blame and became their hated enemy. That was many years before John was instructed to write a letter to the Ephesians. Jesus begins with praise for the congregation. I know your deeds, your hard work, and your perseverance. The Ephesians have been diligent in maintaining orthodoxy, testing those who claim to be apostles, false prophets as Jesus called them in the Gospels. You have persevered and have endured hardships for my name and have not grown weary. Way to go, Ephesus. Christ 
praises these attributes, but reminds them there is more to being his follower than theological purity. The Scottish theologian and scholar William Barclay opined that the orthodoxy of the Ephesians came at the high cost of failing to love their neighbors, their brothers and sisters. In his own letter to the church in Corinth, the Apostle Paul wrote, If I speak in the tongues of men or of angels, but do not have love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have a faith that can move mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. Barclay wrote, All the orthodoxy in the world will never take the place of love. Christ's words here are for more than one congregation in Asia Minor and speak to every age, even today. Now, you've probably heard me say before, I'm not a fan of going around quoting single verses from the Bible because most often they are taken out of context. You know, while made up of many books, the Bible is a single story, understood best as a whole. While it would be a true statement that tornadoes are frightening weather events, that piece of information fails to describe or explain the Wizard of Oz story. Frank Baum did not write a book about weather or even the necessity of following a particular road in life. Even the words, there's no place like home, fails to capture the essence of the Wizard of Oz. Why? Because without love, the story has no purpose. Dorothy didn't miss her house. She missed the love in her home. You know, quote as many Bible verses from memory as you can. Follow every commandment and rule in its pages. Spread the good news and baptize everyone. You can do all of that, but none of that means a thing without love. Jesus tells the Ephesians and us to repent and put love back at the center of our faith. Orthodoxy has its place, but not at the expense of love. Repent. Jesus does acknowledge Ephesus has another thing going for them in that they reject the Nicolaitans. Now, we're not going to spend time on what that means this week as it will come up again in another letter. What we will point out at the end of this letter to Ephesus is the announcement of a reward for repentance and their love. I will give the right to eat from the tree of life in paradise, Jesus says. Is this the same as the tree of the knowledge of good and evil in the Garden of Eden? Some think so, others say it refers to a different tree. Regardless, this tree of life has been off limits to mankind. But through Christ, those who love him and follow him will be able to eat of its fruit in the end. <laughs> so, whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. These are the words of him who is the first and the last, who died and came to life again. 
the opening of the letter to Smyrna. As we said at the beginning of today's service, Smyrna had been destroyed centuries earlier, died, only to be reborn. Its Christian residents would have related to the idea of dying and coming to life again. And they certainly were no stranger to persecution. Smyrna's residents jealously protected the city's image. One had to go along to get along do anything outside the established norms of the city, and you'll pay for it. Even the Jewish leaders living there believed this, although Jesus wrote they really weren't Jewish. You are going to be tested, imprisoned for following me. Note that when he says punishment would last 10 days, 10 is a symbolic number, not an actual fixed sentence. John's readers would have understood 10 days meant an indefinite but short persecution, one that will come to an end only to start up again unexpectedly. The message to Smyrna, hold fast to Christ. I am the first and the last. I was in the world long before Smyrna ever existed, and I will be here long after it is gone. Allegiances to people, wealth, and places like Smyrna will not last. Maintain your loyalty only to the everlasting Christ, even when threatened with death. I've been there. I understand, Christ says. It's a message we still need to hear today. As you realize, many people get swept up in loyalty to teams, uh, politicians, celebrities, countries, philosophies, and prejudice. Those who don't share our worldview earn our abuse. Love it or leave it. When that happens, in effect, we become those civic-minded, patriotic leaders of Smyrna. Is that who we are? In the end, the only loyalty that matters is loyalty to Christ. That's it. That's how we receive the victor's crown and be unfazed by our second death, the first one being our baptism. Jesus warns the battle will be fierce and won only in the love of Christ. Always comes back to love, doesn't it? Love wins. Amen to that. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Now, let us turn our hearts and minds to the Lord in prayer. God of David, who confirmed your love for all people in the gift of a Savior, who are we that we should be so blessed by your grace? Yet in him we have been set apart as a chosen race, a royal priesthood, God's own people called and sent into the world. We who are nothing apart from your saving mercy may yet stand holy and blameless before you because of your grace shown in Jesus Christ. 
We thank you for the household of Christ called the church. In your infinite wisdom, you have brought together a multitude of people and cultures and made them one family through baptism. Together, we proclaim one Savior, Jesus Christ, and one faith. We give thanks for this universal witness to Christ's resurrection and pray for the day when all Christians may join as one around the table. Almighty God, you have promised to hear when we pray in the name of your Son. Therefore, in confidence and trust, we pray for the church that we may be your true disciples and make loving you our neighbors, our brothers and sisters, a priority in our lives. Today we especially pray for Jerry, for Penny and Darla. We continue our prayers for recovery for Stephen and for Jennifer, for Larry and Beverly Smith. We pray for Alan and Terry, for Bobby Alt, for Adrian, Doug and Ashley. We pray for Debbie Burke and Chuck Callahan, for Buster and Corinne, for Debbie Palmer and Ray Palmer, for Michael Palmer. We pray for Debbie Stanley, for Pat Bunton, for Bruce and Joyce and Beverly Fail, for Ashley and for Lorraine Miller. We pray for Barbara Plyler and Judy and TC, for Vicki, and Jim Mole, for Susie and Jody, for Mac and Rick, for Mitchell and Tiffany, for Lorraine, Michaela, and Marilyn. We continue our prayers for Johnny Frazier, for Kay and for Linda, for Claudette and Morgan, for Barbara Moses and Henry Thomason. We pray for Dar Gary, for Nancy Denton, for JC, for Rick and Renee, for Kim's mother, for Elizabeth Haynes, for Les Queen, for Josh Stanley and Holden Wilson. We pray for Sheila Ellis, for Teddy, and for the Philip Maxwell family. Almighty God, you have taught us through Christ that love fulfills the law. May we love you with all our heart, all our soul, all our mind, and all our strength. And may we love our neighbors as ourselves through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever, and who taught us to pray, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And now, brothers and sisters in Christ, let us confess to the world what it is we believe using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please 
Sing along to our closing hymn as we declare, Jesus is Lord of all. Thank you for joining us today in worship from Robbins Memorial Presbyterian in Gastonia. If you appreciated today's online service, please do us a favor and hit the like or thumbs up button. Post a written comment and share the link with others. That really is a big help. Also, you can help out through your generous gifts, tithes, and offerings. In just a few moments, you'll see on screen our mailing address, website address, and a QR code, making it easy to donate. Don't forget about our ongoing school tools drive and the September 21st car show. As always, you are invited to join us in person for worship each Sunday at 11 a.m. or online as of noon each week. Two more letters from Revelation next time. Hope to see you. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that God may exalt you in due time. Cast all your anxiety on the Lord who cares for you. Discipline yourselves. Keep alert. The God of all grace, who has called you to eternal glory in Christ, will restore, support, strengthen, and establish you. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May he make his face to shine upon you and give you his peace now and forevermore. Amen. Mm -hmm.